Good morning. Welcome to Optimal Frequency. I'm Grant. I talk to spirits here at my house using sources of white noise. I then remove the sound of the white noise using an artificial intelligence. We discuss mysteries. We talk to people that have passed on, famous people, not so famous people, spirits in general. So welcome aboard. Today's mystery, D.B. Cooper. Stay tuned. D.B. Cooper session, day two. I have written out two full pages. I probably could have asked more questions, but uh, it would take a long time to put that together, and I'm looking, not looking to do a 20-minute video. So hopefully we can get some solid answers on this. And I'm going to turn on the, e, the VBE EMF pump right now. We used 50 the other day. God came through. Let's use 50 again. I have the sugar bowl over here on this side. I have the kettle fountain set up where it's always on the left side. I'm going to turn this on and we are going to get started. I have not filled the kettle fountain, so I'm going to let it run while it fills. We may get some voices that come through. Okay, I think that's good. Let's plug it in. Good morning, spirits. Team, do you know who we're doing a session on this morning? If you don't know, then you probably shouldn't be here. <laughs> said that? I'm not even joking. Look at this. Look at how it's this, uh, the colander slid off as soon as I said that. Was that a coincidence or did you push that off of there? D.B. Cooper is a media nickname used to refer to an unidentified man who hijacked a Boeing 727 aircraft in the United States airspace between Portland and Seattle on the afternoon of November 24, 1971. 
He extorted $200,000 in ransom, equivalent to $1.3 million today. He parachuted to an uncertain fate over southwestern Washington. The man actually purchased his airline ticket under the name Dan Cooper, but because of a news miscommunication, he became known in popular lore as D.B. Cooper. Available evidence and a preponderance of expert opinion suggests that Cooper probably did not survive his high-risk jump, but the FBI maintained an active investigation for 45 years after the hijacking. Despite a case file that grew to over 60 volumes over that period, no definitive conclusions were reached regarding Cooper's identity or fate. The crime remains the only unsolved air piracy in commercial aviation history. Okay, let's get into this. We've got lots of questions here. Feel free to use the phone and the uh, BB EMF pump to take some energy so you can answer these questions for us. We're doing a session on D.B. Cooper. Was D.B. Cooper a man or a woman? survived the jump on November 24th, 1971. Why did he choose that specific plane to hijack? On Thanksgiving Eve, November 24th, 1971, a man carrying a black attaché case approached the flight counter of Northwest Orient Airlines. He identified himself as Dan Cooper and used cash to purchase a one-way ticket on Flight 305, a 30-minute trip north to Seattle. Cooper boarded the aircraft, ordered himself a drink, a bourbon and soda. Eyewitnesses described a man in his mid-40s wearing a business suit with a black tie and white shirt. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant, situated nearest to him in a jump seat attached to the aft stair door. Schaffner, assuming Cooper was flirting with her, dropped the note unopened into her purse. Cooper leaned toward her and whispered, Miss, you'd better look at that note, I have a bomb. Schaffner recalled that the note mentioned the bomb and it directed her to sit in the seat beside Cooper. Schaffner did as requested, then quietly asked to see the bomb. Cooper opened his briefcase long enough for her to glimpse eight red cylinders, four on top of four, attached to wires coated with red insulation and a large cylindrical battery. After closing the briefcase, he stated his demands, $200,000 in negotiable American currency, four parachutes, two primary and two reserve, and a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the aircraft upon arrival. How old exactly was D.B. Cooper on November 24th, 1971, the night of the jump? Why was he wearing a business suit and tie? Was the bomb a real bomb? What happened to that bomb? Did he just chuck it from him when he went out the plane? Was Cooper working alone or as part of a team? Is the D.B. Cooper case part of the reason why the U.S. government will not negotiate with hijackers slash terrorists? Cooper behaved like a gentleman during the hijacking. Schaffner described him as calm, polite, and well-spoken, not at all consistent with the stereotypes popularly associated with air piracy at the time. He wasn't nervous, flight attendant Tina Mucklow told investigators. He seemed rather nice. He 
He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. As Schaffner grasped her plane was being hijacked and tried to control her emotions, Cooper gently calmed her down. He ordered a second bourbon and soda, paid his drink tab, and offered to request meals for the flight crew during their stop in Seattle. Mucklow asked the hijacker if he had a grudge with Northwest Airlines. Cooper replied, I don't have a grudge against your airline, miss. I just have a grudge. Had D.B. Cooper been taken advantage of all his life and then decided enough was enough, and that's why he wanted some money for himself and he was going to steal it. Was D.B. Cooper worthy of those who thought he was somewhat of a hero? Who did D.B. Cooper have a grudge against? At approximately 7.40 p.m., the Boeing 727 took off with only Cooper, Captain Scott, Flight Attendant Mucklow, First Officer Radizak, and Flight Engineer Harold E. Anderson on board. Two F-106 fighter aircraft from Accord Air Force Base followed behind the airliner, one above it and one below it, out of Cooper's view. After takeoff, Cooper picked up his briefcase and politely told Mucklow to show him how to open the door to the aft staircase. After she did, he told her to join the rest of the crew in the cockpit and remain there with the door closed. As she complied, Mucklow observed Cooper tying something, possibly the money bag, around his waist. At approximately 8 o'clock p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit indicating that the aft air stair apparatus had been activated. The pilots asked on the cabin intercom if Cooper needed assistance. Cooper, apparently confident, picked up the cabin phone and coolly and calmly said no. This was the last communication the crew had with Cooper. The crew soon noticed a subjective change of air pressure indicating that the aft door was open. How accurate is the D.B. Cooper sketch? How come the two pilots trailing the plane never saw D.B. jump? When Cooper jumped, did he lose the money on the way down? Again, I'll ask, did he survive that jump that night? Search efforts focused on Clark and Cowlitz counties, encompassing the terrain immediately south and north, respectively, of the Lewis River in southwest Washington. FBI agents and sheriff's deputies from those counties searched large areas of the mountainous wilderness on foot and by helicopter. Door-to-door -door searches of local farmhouses were also carried out. Other search parties ran patrol boats along Lake Merwin and Yale Lake, the reservoir immediately to its east. No trace of Cooper, nor any of the equipment presumed to have left the aircraft with him, was found. Are the parachutes that D.B. jumped with still out there in the wilderness? What was D.B. Cooper's real name? Where did D.B. Cooper work? On February 10, 1980, 8-year-old Brian Ingram was vacationing with his family on the Columbia River at a beachfront known as Tina or Tena Bar, about 9 miles downstream from Vancouver, Washington and 20 miles southwest of Ariel. He uncovered three packets of the ransom cash as he raked the Sandy River Bank to build a campfire. The bills were disintegrated but still bundled in rubber bands. FBI technicians confirmed that the money was indeed a portion of the ransom, two packets of $120 bills each and a third packet of 90, all arranged in the same order as when given to Cooper. 
In 1986, after protracted negotiations, the recovered bills were divided equally between Ingram and Northwest Orient's insurer. The FBI retained 14 examples as evidence. Ingram sold 15 of his bills at auction in 2008 for about $37,000. To date, none of the 9,710 remaining bills has turned up anywhere. Their serial numbers remain available online for public search. The Columbia River ransom money and the Air Star instruction placard remain the only confirmed physical evidence from the hijacking ever found outside the aircraft. Is D.B. Cooper alive today? After watching the 2020 documentary, The Mystery of D.B. Cooper, it seems most logical to me that Richard Floyd McCoy was D.B. Cooper. Is that correct? Was Richard Floyd McCoy D.B. Cooper or was he a copycat jumper? Is there anything else we should know about this case? Okay, thank you spirits for coming through and answering my questions on D.B. Cooper. Do you have a message for me today? Do you spirits have a message for any of our viewers? If so, please state their name and leave them a message. All right, thanks again, spirits. Love, peace, joy, and adventure to you. Sending out the light. Same to you, viewers. Love, peace, joy, and adventure. Stay happy, everyone. We'll catch you all in the next video. Oh,